Okay, that was wonderful, Tina. Thank you. What a beautiful voice. Thank you so much. We try. <laughs> yes, we do. So, uh, thanks for coming to Bitspiration. Thanks for having me. Um, my initial question was, you know, from studio musician and singer in New York City to a leading venture capital startup lawyer in London, but it seems that you're still the top singer. <laughs> How do you do it? Do you have time to sing with your uh, daytime job? That's a really good question. Um, I don't, but what, I, what I've de decided to do, um, I don't have a family, so I think I kind of dedicated my life to music before becoming a lawyer, and it's always been my passion, so it's been more important to me than just about anything else. So any free time I've ever had has always been music. So and that's what I do now. I still practice, I study, and um, whenever I have free time. Wow. So tell us about the transition you know, from being in New York and being in the music industry and becoming a lawyer. Was that easy? Uh, hard or uh, just came to you, you had an eure eureka moment? No. So I, I went to law school because a person that I was in love with and I ended up marrying thought I'd be a good politician. It wasn't actually anything I w was thinking about. I was very interested in politics and always was. But I guess when someone you love tells you to do something, you kind of consider it. <laughs> just do it. Yeah, you do it. Uh, and it was fine, but um, he then went on to produce records and had a lot of success and got me involved in this project. So that's why I kind of segued out of, I went to law school, you know, at the normal time that most people do right after university, but didn't really get into it until later on. Um, I, I didn't find the transition that hard only because, you know, I, I tend to have both right and left brain working. So it wasn't that difficult. And I find that the, especially for the kind of law that I do, which is working with emerging technology companies and investors who invest in them, very similar business model to the music business. So you have people who are looking to create something or invest in something that's going to be a hit, so to speak, just like the record companies sign artists hoping that they're going to have hits. Very similar type of people, very similar. So speaking, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Um, so. Um, just to get people excited in the room, any famous people you sang with? A lot. Um, I think a lot of them aren't necessarily famous now, so I won't list all of them, but I sang on Madonna's first album. I'm Madonna's the, first album. Yeah, the high notes on Holiday, which she couldn't hit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I, I've sang with U2 and Bruce Springsteen and a group called New Order, which I don't know if... They're famous here. They're still famous yeah, here. I mean, their, their new album is amazing. I, I'm still a huge fan of New Order. I got mentioned in the book they just wrote, too. So. And I heard that one of your friends was friends with the Ramones. Oh, my, yeah, well, they, from, yeah, from child, my sister, actually. Your sister. Oh, yeah. No, I, I know loads of famous people, but um, they're just so, like anybody else, really. So from famous uh, musicians from Madonna, YouTube, Bruce Springsteen, you land in the startup world and you work with SoundCloud, um, you work with... TransferWise. Uh, Index Ventures. Yeah. Uh, I hope I'm not violating, you know, attorney no, client confidentiality. They're on the website. They're on the website. <laughs> yeah. So... You were saying that there are similarities between, you know, the music business where you need a hit and this uh, venture capital emerging, uh, emerging company business. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. So, so, so basically, and, and I think this is how it's, it's, it's very interesting. So artists are, are like entrepreneurs and their similarity is that they're looking to create something that affects other people. So an artist is looking to create art that people are going to love, enjoy. Uh, they may not be motivated by that. They may just be motivated by the desire to create. But I think the end result is, for me, especially as a performing artist, yeah, it's great to write a good song, but if you can't sing it and watch people like it, it's, it's, it falls flat. 
So similarly with entrepreneurs, they, they come up with ideas to create things that are going to affect people, make their lives better, um, and so on. Of course they want to make money, everyone wants to make money, but if you're not really into what it is, it, you're never going to succeed. So there's a huge similarity between an artist, which I am, and an, and an entrepreneur, which actually I am now too because I have my own law firm. But, and so I get along with entrepreneurs because I understand what makes them tick? So, what makes them tick? Is it you know uh, the fame, with the creativity aspect? Do they want to get rich? Um, do they no, want to be I in think, the spotlight? I think the getting rich is an end product. It's a result. It's not. It's not a motivating factor for most people. Uh, sure, you know because because the, the worst the worst part is to not be able to do what you love, and you kind of have to make money in order to be able to continue to do that. But so, do you see that passion in your um, startup oh, God, clients? Oh God, yeah. Oh God, yeah. I mean, you you must know this too. Well, I mean, the first meeting with an entrepreneur, they come in with a slide deck, a computer, and they talk about themselves for forty five minutes. For f <laughs> at least. And they have no questions. <laughs> yeah. Sounds, sounds similar. So what do you think you know, helps you as an entrepreneur coming from the music industry to be a good advisor for um, startups? Well, I think part of it is that I do understand how they, um, how they tick. And also because I work with investors too, I, I have a really good understanding of how the whole process works and I can sort of tell them how investors are likely to react to various things. And, and also, this is the discipline that I've, it's funny, because I read somewhere, I haven't looked into this in detail, but there's, there are studies that have shown that people who actually play instruments or study music um, are more disciplined and, and productive in their other work. So I think it's, it's actually helped me tremendously, especially classical music, which I, I studied after I was, uh, when, I, when I started my law stuff for real after, um, being a dance and pop artist. I studied classical music in New York at Juilliard, and that is a very disciplined study. And so it, I think it just helps. But that's, you know, you hear a lot about, you know, startups are a shit show and, you know, everything is chaos. There's no business plans. And then you come in with a music background telling them, well, you need to get organized. You need to have, you know, your company formed. Everybody has to be in line. Right. I mean, it must be, you know, well, crazy. It's, it's funny because I don't know how I got like this because I don't think this has anything to do with the music and the creative side but I've always been incredibly organized. I probably started making lists when I could start writing. So <laughs> I don't, I mean, it's a ridiculous habit to have, but I, I got it from somewhere. So I just happened to be incredibly organized. And that's part of what, what a lawyer who works with startup companies has to do is help the clients get organized, as you know. So um, a, a lot of folks in the room are either you know, planning to be unicorns or are unicorns, but they really don't know yet. So if you had any you know, um, words of advice, one, how to hire, how to recognize a good lawyer for startups, and two, how to recognize that talent in them. The talent in themselves? Yeah. Oh, wow. That, that well, okay, well, let, let's, uh, let's, uh, First the, about the lawyer, yeah, how to lawyer. recognize that, that a good lawyer a for to, startups. To answer. Um, so, I mean, I think, that in my view, there are three factors to consider when choosing a lawyer. And the first one is that they have the necessary experience or expertise for what you want to do. So, this is, goes to what you're saying. Um, and how do you find that out? It's, I think it's important that you, you speak to other entrepreneurs and other people who deal in the startup space and get referrals and talk to two or maybe three different people. I think it's very important. If they don't have a lot of experience and they don't do this kind of stuff every day as a day job, move on. No matter how much he's a nice guy, she's a nice girl. Or it's my cousin and they're cheap. <laughs> so, which we see a lot. So. The, the first box to tick is that they really have a lot of experience. 
The second one is a personality thing, and it's chemistry. It's like any relationship. Do I like speaking to this person? Can I deal with them on a day-to-day -day basis? Do I trust them? Do I think they're full of shit? Do they make no sense? And then the third is price. And the unfortunate thing that you see with a lot of startups is that they choose a lawyer based on who's the cheapest. And you get what you pay for. I know it's a trite saying, but it's absolutely true. And if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So <laughs> I, I would, my biggest advice is to not pick a lawyer based on how cheap they are. Okay, so that was the infomercial from the lawyers. Yeah. So now about the... <laughs> yes. So now about the talent. Um, recognizing talent is very hard. Um, what's even harder is fostering that talent. And I think, you know, one of the things that, you know, your, your uniqueness is, you know, you came from the pop, uh, pop world, then you discovered um, opera. Um, now you're transitioning into jazzish stuff. Jazzy opera. Uh, jazzy opera. So how do you, you know, recognize that talent and you know, foster it and like, be open to the next phase? As an entrepreneur? As an entrepreneur. Because I think you know, you're not only a singer, well, not okay. only a lawyer. I can only speak to my experience. And, and I think one of the things that has held true for me is that I'm a student of life. And I just keep on learning, and I keep on challenging myself and trying to do things that make me grow. Um, and I think that this entrepreneurs are similarly sp spaced in that um, I, I haven't met an entrepreneur that doesn't thoroughly understand the market in which they're in. Otherwise, they haven't actually come through my door. And so they must have spent a lot of time studying that. Okay. And so I think that that's a critical factor for any entrepreneur is to do your homework, but keep doing your homework, even if it's not your homework today. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. keep, keep learning. I think that's so, the... So being an entrepreneur is being in constant learning mode. And, I think so. And adapting to new realities and new situations. Yeah. So, um, from your perspective as a lawyer, you have all of these uh, entrepreneurs in London who are pivoting. When is the moment when they transition or they have their next big idea? Is it, you know, um, do they come to you and they tell you, okay, we're moving to the next thing? Or is it the investor who's like, you know, I'm tired of these guys and we're moving to the next thing? What's, what's it like? Um. I don't think we get that involved at that level. I mean, I, I've been involved in a few companies that have pivoted um, where they actually drew me into the process because it, it, it involved having to shed bits of the business and there was legal structuring involved in that. Um, but otherwise, no, I think, I think from, from that, from what you're talking about though, what, what I have learned and is that it's really important to focus and not as an entrepreneur, spread yourself too thin and try too many things, which is also um, true for an artist in certain respect, because if you're trying to, to please too many people and tick too many boxes, it's never going to succeed. So one of the reasons we've seen entrepreneurs have to pivot is because they didn't, they were trying to do too much at once. And it was too much to handle. So focus. It's like really specific focus, yeah. So you have to be a uh, pop singer for the teens from so-and-so Well, yeah, you're a pop singer. You're not a blues singer or a jazz singer. I mean, although, I mean, t today there's a lot more fusion in music, so it's, it's actually becoming less relevant, I think. It, so it was more relevant years ago. But, but, but even with that, I think what it does mean, though, is the focus on the process. So whatever type of music you're singing, you know, you need to really focus on the process of making that happen. So that's the lawyer in you asking, you know, I need a checklist, you know, let's have a process. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. So uh, you moved from New York to, Lon to London. Why? You know, is London 
the place to be. Okay, so yes, I, mo I actually moved to do music. I didn't go. What's I, that? I moved to do music. I didn't go for um, to work in a, in a legal profession. So um, before moving to London, I worked at a law firm in New York for seven years. I worked with a lot of life science companies doing IPOs. They were all venture backed, so I did venture capital deals with them. And then I quit that job and was doing went into an opera training program at Juilliard, as I mentioned and was just working part-time, doing just bits of whatever law. And so I moved to London to work on an album with a producer there, and it didn't work, the whole thing didn't work. But I started working with a law firm in London who, you know, thankfully for me, decided to rent some space in their building to Index Ventures. So <laughs> um, I started working with Index, and that's kind of where it all started. So. You, you got to London at the very moment when the tech scene started to... It was before. It was before. So it was right after the tech bubble had burst and nobody was doing anything. And then 9-11 and then happened. So can you tell and us... So no one was doing anything. Anything. So imagine, you know, London before Seed Camp and all of, you know, the good stuff. So can you tell us, you know, how things evolved in London? Sure. Uh, yeah, it was great, actually. So, uh, you know, there were a couple of years there where nobody was investing, no startups could get funded. So something like but, Poland today or yeah, Eastern Europe. Well, worse, probably worse, though. But the good news was there were a lot of people around and there, nobody was busy, so everyone was going to conferences and events, and I got to meet everybody because I didn't have any work to do, so I, it was like I had plenty of time to go out and network, uh, which is challenging these days. But when deals started to get off the ground, they were all, so at this point, people didn't really still, investors still didn't trust the internet. They didn't understand how to monetize. E-commerce was just, you know, still just Amazon. <laughs> and so any deals that were getting funded were very deep tech. It was a lot of life science, a lot of hardware, a lot of um, enterprise solutions, semiconductors. Semiconductors. A lot of telecoms. That's where, that's where all the money was going. Um, most founders were 30 plus. They weren't young. With kids. Y yeah, they were with kids. Um, they were doctors or had PhDs or, you know, stuff like that. And the rounds were two, three, five, six, seven million. Very different than today, obviously. So then, once people started to understand how to work the internet and what the possibilities were, um, things started to change. And that's when the seed camp came into play. And oh, Go ahead, so, you're going to ask a question. So what are the possibilities now with internet and, you know, from your perspective in London? And um, are we going to see another tech bubble? Are we in a tech bubble? You know, are you worried? about, you know, um, you know, the industry? Is there an industry or this is just, you know, total randomness and chaos happening and we're just here to enjoy the party? Well, I think on some level there's, a, there's always total randomness and chaos and, you know, because it's not like there's anyone controlling this industry. It's, it evolves and changes based on organic movements in the world which are also affected by all sorts of stuff we can't see or don't know. Right, so I, I do think that there is always a possibility that there will be a bubble burst. But I don't think it's the same as before, and I, I actually don't think. What might happen is that less companies will get funded. But I think the core of what's happening is real. So what's interesting, and I, and I would love to get feedback on this if people think I'm wrong, but, you know, it's a very simplistic view of things, is that all the technology today is focused on making people's lives easier, but also on getting it, making it easier to make money on the internet. Hmm. So, so c can you talk about, you know, what you're seeing in terms of, like, trends, yeah. like, business trends, and maybe sure. um, just dabble about, like, you know, what's kosher and what's not kosher, you know, with legal terms? Okay, well, those are two big different questions. Okay, so, you know, what we're seeing, a lot of companies getting funded are doing marketplaces. 
artificial intelligence, and machine learning. Those are like, and then of course, you know, you've got um, life science, which is, you know, drugs for curing diseases, always popular. And then um, fintech. Now, fintech is, you know, a little iffy. What is fintech? Financial it's... tech. So fintech is, is iffy because it's a, it's a high, highly regulated industry and, you know, changes in banking could cause a company to tank tomorrow. So that's much more volatile than other industries. But uh, we see a lot of investors who are looking for companies and, and also hard technology, like technologies that help people in emerging countries, for instance, charging mobile phones, like technologies that are going to improve communication. Those kind of things are all you know, being very popular. In terms of legal, ter but it, it actually one thing I did want to say about the bubble bursting is I think that there are, are tax rules in the UK particularly which have enabled a lot of companies to get funded who wouldn't otherwise get funded. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a bit of a bubble there and that's a lot of stuff at the bottom that doesn't necessarily need to be there. <laughs> Um, so in terms of legal terms, what, what, what would you like so, to So um, you're really known for uh, seed investments and like uh, you represent a lot of uh, um, venture capital that's doing seed investments. Have the terms evolved? Can you talk about, you know, what's sure. standard terms now in London? Sure. So um, we do do a lot of seed investments, but we do a lot of all stage investments. And I think what has informed the seed investment is that it's stackable so that it's, it's not as maybe fulsome as the later stage rounds, but it's got the same kind of stuff, so it looks the same. So building onto it and, and, and having further funding as a company grows becomes easier rather than harder, and you don't have investors coming and starting to pick apart your documents. On the very small phases, though, where you're dealing with angel investors, we're trying to standardize it so that they get no rights. The documents are incredibly simple. So it, angel investors get no rights in London? Well, or not always. No, 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 not always. That's what we're trying for, though. <laughs> that, that, that's, the, that's the movement. So any um, um, crazy stories about, you know, or crazy stories or mistakes your clients have made or, um, you know, maybe you can tell me, I'll, I take the Fifth Amendment and I, I'm not going to tell you anything, but um, any, you know, war stories that you want to share with the community here? Well, I mean, w one of the, there's, there's three things that, that investors are really keen on when they're looking at a business. One is, um, is the cap table what we say it is? So are there any shares out there that you didn't tell us about? Do you own the IP you said you owned? And is, that, is there anybody out there who's trying to prevent you from doing your business? So those are kind of the three most important things. So some of the war stories we've seen all revolve around share capital and IP. I think the worst IP story I've seen is that, um, I mean, there was a case just recently where we were representing an investor who was investing in a company and they got sued by another company for infringing IP and before the investment closed, they lost the case, so. Whoa. The deal was over, but um, the interesting story was we had a client who had did a reorganization and the lawyer screwed up and the trademarks were being transferred from one company to another company, but the date on the transfer document was dated after they dissolved the company. That Whoa. was transferring it. So the trademarks actually were owned by the Queen of England. Because <laughs> that's what happens when a company is dissolved owning an asset that nobody has a right to. So, so that, that took some fixing. <laughs> it was yeah. quite difficult. So did you call the Queen of England? You know? I, went, I went to her and I sang. Okay. Please can, we, please can we have these trademarks back? No, wow. I was kidding. We didn't do that. So, um, if you had any advice for, um, you know, you, you're here in Eastern Europe and Poland for the first time, and 
you're an American living in London, doing tech, what advice would you give to people building tech companies here? Okay, so, so I think, um, I don't know a lot about the Polish scene yet, but there are a couple of things. I, you know, I think, obviously, think global. Um, from no, day one. From day one. Uh, it's going to be harder to get investment from investors outside of this country if they don't see the global proposition. I, I think another thing that, that Titus has sort of made an, made an issue of is you know, to, to try to set up a holding company structure that's either U.S. or U.K. because it's m very difficult for foreign investors to, to inv I mean, invest in, in a company where the language is not their own and they don't understand the legal process. Of course, there are tax issues with doing that, so you have to clearly look at that. If you really think you're never going to leave this country, it doesn't make sense, but then you probably shouldn't be taking investment from those people in the first place. Um, what else? Community building. Community building, yeah. Um, so I think, you know, what um, fascinates me about London is that, you know, there's a give um, first approach than taking. It seems like a lot of people are sharing, they're giving back to the community. Absolutely. Um, what's your experience with that? Uh, totally. I mean, I, I actually don't know why. Um, it does become difficult, though, because, you know, the more you give, the more people want from you because they see you're adding value, and then you could spend your entire day just chatting with people and not making any money. So, it, it, whoever, whoever you are, lawyer or otherwise. So, you have to be careful. But there are so many accelerators, there are so many events in London, and people just go and they talk and I, I've never, hardly ever met anyone who wouldn't just talk to somebody else even if it's, it ends up just being five or ten minutes. So I, I mean it's a, it's a great community. I don't, I don't know how it started but it just did. It just did. Yeah. So, so you're um, a mentor and an advisor to Seed Camp. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about, you know, what is Seed Camp? Sure. Um, how can folks get into Seed Camp and why Seed Camp is important in Europe? Yeah, so Seed Camp was the first accelerator in London. I'm now working with two others which are very different, but Seed Camp's an accelerator, and what they do is they work with companies who are generally just starting, but some of them are a bit more later stage, and they connect them to the whole network that they have in London, which is vast at this stage, because it started in 2007. And it was started by a bunch of VCs, unlike a lot of other of these kind of accelerators or incubators that are started by entrepreneurs. And so the investor network is massive, um, and the mentor network is now massive. And so uh, you go into a three-month program when you join Seed Camp, and they give you office space if you need it, and they have product strategy, demos, days, I mean, also uh, marketing strategy. They help entrepreneurs connect and so one, one you know my poster child about seed camp is a company called transferwise which is you know now a unicorn and I met them at a seed camp event and you know did a seed round for them and now they've you know they've raised multiple multiple millions but did they need to go into seed camp well they felt it was a valid uh, proposition for their network and you know I think it's it's it stayed them well so um, I guess the million dollar question people might have is hey I'm a startup from Eastern Europe do I need to go to an accelerator what's you know the value added is it the investor network am I gonna you know learn how to you know uh, scale learn how to market myself what it's am I gonna those things it's all of those things I'm gonna meet Tina Baker who'll you're gonna meet for me. me but you're also you're gonna meet a lot of entrepreneurs from many different countries who are, because it's not just London-based countries, like this week, in fact, they do, they're doing an event in Berlin, which I would be at if I wasn't here. And in Berlin, the, com the, com the companies that go there are from Germany, from Austria, from Italy. Um, they've got com companies from all over the world. So you get to meet entrepreneurs who have a different perspective from all over the place. And, and the, mentor, the mentor network is massive. So, uh, two cheers for Seed Camp. Oh, they've so, done a great job, I think. 
um, so we talked about the seed stage, we talked about accelerators, um, we talked about a bit uh, about investors. So um, can you talk about, you know, exits and what happens during an exit, you know, do the champagne bottles explode and, you know, how happy, what, is it a really happy event? And well, it can be. Um I haven't seen too many of those recently, though. So, uh... Recently, I mean, the exit market is not as buoyant as one would hope. And we're seeing a lot of very low-value exits, a lot of what we call acqui-hires, where the buyer isn't really interested in the product. They want the team. So we, we sold a company to Dropbox, for example, two years ago that was venture-backed. And it was, you know, it was treated just like a real exit, but... Um, they shut the app down right after the acquisition, and the team moved to San Francisco, and that was the end. So how do you make your exit successful? Because uh, the folks in the room are uh, mostly at you know, uh, seed, pre-incubation stage, and you know, they, they want to be successful. They don't want to make the mistakes. So what are the mistakes they can make um, that would uh, damage a successful exit for them? Well, th th there's, two, there's two parts to that question. One is a business side and the other is the legal side. So on the business side, you know, I think it's very difficult because I think if you start out with the proposition that I'm going to build a company in order to exit, you might make a lot of mistakes. I think you need to focus on building the best product you can build and whether or not anyone wants to buy that is another issue. I mean, I know there are a lot of companies out there, for instance, that have propositions or products that augment Facebook, let's say, and they, they think Facebook's going to buy them. Well, you know, Facebook might, but they're only going to buy a few. They're not going to buy every single company out there that has a proposition that can be used on Facebook. So I think those things are kind of dangerous. So I, I don't, you know, I think that's more of a question for a VC, for instance, because I don't know enough about it, but you know, my gut instinct tells me that you, you just have to position the company to be the best it can be doing what it does, and somebody will need it, right? So build products people want. That's right. You know, and so, somebody is going to want to buy that. All right, so, and, and the more people want to buy it, the more they're going to be companies who think it's going to be useful to them. Uh, on the legal side, I would say to trust, I mean, obviously this is not, this is easier said than done. It's just try to keep your cap table simple because the more complicated, the more shareholders you have, the harder it is to, to proceed through an exit transaction. Um, and also, if you're in a U.S. or an English company, it's easier. If, if your buyer is U.S., it's much easier to be a U.S. company to get acquired. The exit process is much more streamlined. Um, we're, we're doing an exit now. We've, we just got the SPA today with a company that's done a crowdfunding and has hundreds of shareholders. So that kind of thing, I, you know, check back with me in a few months. This could be a nightmare. Interesting. <laughs> so um, exits are complicated. Yes. Building companies is complicated. Seating is, is complicated. Anything simple in, um, from your perspective. Wow. I'm getting into you. Now, I, I want you to know that I was given a script, and he has, as, he has asked me almost none of the questions on the script. Oh. So <laughs> this is OK. I just need a second to think about you, that You one. know, Tina is one of, I, no, Tina is the smartest lawyer I've met. And she has great perspective. And I'm personally inspired by her because, oh, thank you. because she's, you know, not only a, a great lawyer, but she's a person who sees the big picture and the small picture. So uh, we had some scripted questions, and I'm like... He's, he's going off piece. That's okay. No, it's fine. Okay. Okay, so what is simple? I think what's really simple is just boiling everything down to how do I make this work the best and, and just, you know, trying to focus on that. Okay. I, I think that's the only thing. And so I do, from a legal perspective... We have no interest in spending loads of times, loads of time on funding rounds. Yeah, so that means for you guys and the guys watching the YouTube, don't make things complicated for us. Yeah. So 
We want simple. Yeah, we like simple. So we try to simplify the documents, buy the term sheets, and get everything agreed in advance. Um, so I'm all about simplifying the process. OK, so um, there's going to be one lucky person, one lucky person, who will ask Tina a question from the audience. So anybody, raise your hand. Wow. No, oh, there's a gentleman over there going for one. Uh, can we get him a microphone? Hello. Uh, who, who was the... Who heard, the yeah. guy in the gray hoodie. Hi, I'm Severin. Um, I kind of follow the similar path as you do, since I'm the both musician and the startup person. What whatever. was the first thing you said? You were... I'm a, I'm a musician as well and a startup person. And um, from your perspective, have you met a lot of musicians in the law startup world and the opposite? Yes. And did it help you well, in not, your path? Yes. Not just law, though. I mean, there are a lot of musicians who are lawyers. There are also a lot of musicians who are venture capitalists. Uh, a lot. And I'm, I'm, in, I'm in a venture capital band called the All Stars. All stars. And w w we play at an investor event. We did it last year. We're doing it again this year. Uh, rock and roll. It's rock and roll, by the way. Um, but the, your, the second part of your question was, do, does it help you? Yeah, I, I think it, I think it helps tremendously because it's a creative. You know, music is creative process, and your clients are engaged in a creative process. So. The, I mean, the last thing I would want is a dry lawyer who doesn't really get what I'm doing, understand what I'm doing, and, you know, who's just interested in charging me and making money, which most, law that's what, you know, most lawyers, I, I have to say this because, and I feel bad because, you know, present company excluded. Thank you. Um, most lawyers that I have met, they go to law school because they don't know what else to do. It's not... You know, except for like people who are doing civil rights and things like that. It's not, and it's, that's why I went. I didn't know what else to do. It's not something that most people are really passionate about. So, so you meet a lot of people who it's just a job. And they take it really, really seriously. And they're very good and committed and ethical and so forth. But they're not passionate in the same way their clients are. And yeah. so that's why I feel it has helped me in this area because I'm on the same wavelength with the clients. And so, so we're going to do one more question F from Stu. Stu. Oh, Microphone. Nice. And quick question. Right. We're, we quick question. A you brought up funding, ease of funding and the seed rounds. But what I'm seeing and observing is right now there's a scarcity of capital for follow-on rounds. Are you seeing that? Absolutely. Um, I think the Series A is very difficult, and even some of our clients on Series B are having trouble filling out syndicates and, and getting it to the level. There, there is a, a, that's why I said there's a lot of companies getting funded who shouldn't be, and it, it kind of might be diverting attention. So I think it is. It's, it's a problem right now. Okay. Thank you, Tina. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.